But firstly, just to remind ourselves, or we may ask ourselves, well, what is fasting prayer for, you know, as a Christian and to live a Christian life? Well, generally, uh, fasting and prayer will involve not taking uh, food or drink or food, not water. And then we can see this in um, Esther chapter 4, verse 16, and uh, the Gospel of uh, Matthew 4, verse 2, as well as Luke 4, verse 2. But even though we have this as an understanding of what it involves to fast, we need to actually appreciate much more so what we are considering in our mindset with regards to fasting and prayer. So when we think about reasons for fa fasting and prayer, it could be, for example, to repent and acknowledge our faults because we want to change. We need to change and we need to be determined for that change. It could be that we face a, a spiritual uh, obstacle, an obstacle which is definitely beyond our human way or, or, of, of trying to solve it, which shows that as human beings, we're limited, but we need God's power and strength to help us uh, overcome the difficulty that we face. So if we're talking about it in uh, casting out demons, something that we as human beings have limitations but we are looking to rely on the power of God and we're looking for God to intervene in this particular situation in terms of casting out demon. Then it could be that if, for example, we look into the Holy Scriptures, uh, when we study the Holy Scriptures, there could be something that we're not too sure about in terms of God's plan, in terms of God, what is it that we are trying to understand with what we're reading and we're not able, able to make sense of what we're reading. So in these situations, it could also be an opportunity for us to, when we go in fasting prayer, to actually uh, look to God to help us get uh, receive a, a deeper understanding of insight into the word of God. So that from that insight and understanding, then we can uh, share it with those in private who may be of uh, more reputation with the word of God than ourselves, but then also, uh, from this uh, reasoning and understanding that God has shared with us, then we can have a better appreciation of what it is that God is uh, sharing with us to share with others in light of the truth of God's word. But it also means that on our part, we need to have a humble heart and mind for receiving uh, the word of God and to be true to God's word. And also that allows us also to be learning about the direction of where God is leading us and guiding us to as we continue to submit to God. So these are just a few reasons why we may fast in prayer, pray. So what we can do is look at a few situations, a few examples of this. So firstly, uh, in Nehemiah chapter nine, verse one and two, Nehemiah chapter nine, verse uh, one and two, it says, now in the 24th day of the month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Then those of the Israelite lineages separate themselves from the foreigners and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. So what we see here is uh, the Israelite lineage gathering together, separating themselves from the foreigners in order to begin to confess their wrongs. Now, in order to confess their wrongs, they were willing to remain together. And we find they're willing to give their attention to acknowledge their faults. But when they're acknowledging their faults, they're able to think about what it is that they've done wrong, what it is that the forefathers have done wrong and acknowledge it. Acknowledge it to who? Acknowledge it to God. Because they realized their, their error, but they also realize they want to uh, pursue a turning point with God for good, for the good of God's people, so that when they pursue that turnaround time, turn around, then they find that they can better walk with God, so that they continue to go forward in a wall of faith to God and a wall of faithfulness to God. So as they continue to walk in that wall of faithfulness to God, they pursue God in such a way that they are free from this distraction. 
but to give their attention to God to discover that change. So this is what would happen during the time of uh, Nineveh, uh, sorry, the time of Nehemiah, in order to discover that turning point of change and to walk with God and walk in holiness with God. Likewise, when we look at uh, Daniel, we find that Daniel was also uh, one who also engaged in a uh, fasting prayer. So in Daniel chapter nine, verse three to six, we find that for, for Daniel, he set his face towards the Lord and he make a request. But one thing we can learn about the prayer of Daniel at this time is that, yes, in verse four to Daniel chapter nine, verse four to six, we see he prayed to God. We see acknowledge God of whom he is and what he does. Uh, that God, he, he keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. But there's one thing we notice about Daniel, and that is he didn't forget his identity. He didn't forget he is part of the people of God. But what we can also see is that he realizes he's part of the problem of God's people, of what they face. That's why in verse five and six, it says, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. So for Daniel, yes, he makes requests for God in, 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 in pleading with God. But in these confessions, he sees the problem of God's people, but he also sees himself as part of the problem, let alone seeing people that are experiencing the problem in, in uh, where they're falling short of God's uh, standard or requirement. So today we need to think about ourselves as much as we see problems, do we see ourselves as part of the problem? And can we acknowledge before God that as much as we see problems, that we see ourselves as part of the problem. Can we acknowledge that before the Lord? And can we uh, pursue that turning point with the fellow people of God? So when we talk about being of the same mind and same heart and singing from the same hymn sheet, we, think, we see that Daniel was able to do that. And we also need the same heart and mindset to do so together in order to bring about this effective change and for God to see that true heart and also see the heart that we really want to change. And we want to, and we want to present that heart to God so that he can see our confession, but also he can see that we want to change. And we uh, desire deeply his guidance to change, to be a better one to walk with God. So this is what we can see from uh, Daniel. And this is also something that we should also think about whether we can actually take that into our prayers as well. Given the situations that we see, observe the thoughts that we have and the thoughts that we have together. Another area of reasons why fasting and prayer is, is helpful is because of humility. If we are pursuing God, we need to have a humble heart. When God sees the humble heart, he will see the turning point of change within the heart because he sees the willingness to turn to God and obey his word. So in 1 Kings 21, verse 27 to 29, 1 Kings 21 verse 27 to 29 so it was when ah ahab heard those words that he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning and the word of the lord came to elijah the tishbite saying see how ahab has humbled himself before me because he has humbled himself before me i will not bring the calamity in his days, in the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. So 
Here we see the steps of Ahab. Ahab is listening and hearing the word of God and hearing the need to change and be in mourning and be in sadness about what he has heard and learned. But he wants to make the change. Yet we also find that for Elijah, we also find that he can see the, the change, but also the Lord can actually see the turning point in the heart of Ahab at this time to pursue that change. So yeah, the king does have status. Ahab does have a status, but he also recognizes his limitation and fault in light of God's word. But with God who observes, then we find that God can also bring about that change of helping uh, Ahab, Ahab to change because there God is wanting to show favor. Favor. So here it has to begin with the heart and willingness to turn to the way of God. And then when God sees that, when God sees that humility, obedience, and that contrite heart to change, then God will intervene and God will help to show favor. Another one, another uh, example in the scripture as we see is, is Jonah. Jonah 3, you know, we know about Jonah where Jonah, he firstly rejected a mission which God asked him to, to do, which is go to preach to the people of Nineveh. Eventually, after the second time of asking, we find that Jonah did go and he did uh, preach God's word. And then when the message of God reached the people of Nineveh, when it reached the, the king, then we find, yes, he had a status. But also we find that he assembled quickly the people of Nineveh, Nineveh whether they were young, whether they're old, it didn't matter. All of them needed to hear God's message and hear the word of the king who became tender to this word of God, this message of the Lord, to then be able to want to turn and change. But what we see is that if we look at uh, Jonah chapter 3, verse 5 to 9, in verse 9 in particular, who can tell? Who can tell whether God is going to relent and turn away from his anger? So for the king of Nineveh and also for the people of Nineveh at that time, whether they were young or old, they all recognize they need to turn to God. They need to repent. They need to change. They need to see a turning point for good in order to discover the mercy of God to them. So in that pursuit, they're looking for change and they're looking for the one true God to show that favor towards them. Yes, they experienced it because they were determined to change at that time. That's the reason why eventually when God saw this change in heart and saw the determination of the works, because prayer is a work, fasting prayer is also a work. Because God saw this and the change occurred, because of that determination, then God saw the heart of determination and therefore God was able to show favor to them. Unfortunately, you know, a hundred years later, we find that these same people, they were determined to walk away from God and reject the way of God. That's why eventually a hundred years later then, God then decided he was against the people of Nineveh because they were determined to change and turn away from God's word. So then when we think about it, it's just like the time of Noah. Noah saw the people of God, God's people, turn towards idolatry. So when, uh, when Moses learned about the people of God turning towards idolatry, you know, when he come down from the mountain, he went up. So why did he go up? He went up to be that bridge to see whether God would be willing to heed the prayer and turn from his anger towards his people. Why? Because at that time, God wanted to destroy his very own people. And so for Moses, he was that bridge 
in the hope that God would turn away from his anger towards his own people because they, because they sin against him, because they went against his commandment. So during this time of, you know, 40 days, 40 nights, we find that God did indeed give an answer. He did relent and God was willing to show favor towards or compassion towards his people once again. So Moses was the bridge. Who else was gonna be the bridge? No one else was there to intervene. But Moses was willing to go back up to confide in God, to confess the wrongs of the people. So this is something that we can also think about in our own small way about how we can actually take these matters to God in our prayer and to see whether God will tell from our intercession that genuineness of heart whether that is a genuine heart of wanting to be determined to change so when we pursue after fasting prayer we will discover just like in psalm 109 verse 4 or 24 rather psalm 109 verse 24 that our knees, when we take up, when we go into fasting prayer, we may find that our knees will weaken, our flesh will become feeble. But despite this, we can discover the worthwhileness that physically, while we experience this, the worthwhileness is actually to discover God's answer of help to us. And that in our weaknesses, God can manifest his spiritual power to bring about the turning point in us or in our fellow people of God, to bring about that change because we are looking to involve God's power. We're looking for God to intervene so that we gain the goodness of God at the time of our weakness. So when we are limited, we can discover God is unlimited. But in order to discover that unlimitedness before God, unlimited power of God, then really, uh, really we need to demonstrate or show proof to God that we really need him and we need his help and that God is that right way in order to discover yeah, his blessed favour towards us in whatever circumstance we face. That's why it's, um, it's so, so important. Um, there was one time where there was a, a youth in, a, in America. He had the Holy Spirit. He lost the Holy Spirit. He didn't testify why he lost the Holy Spirit. He didn't say where he went wrong or why he might have gone wrong. But he lost the Holy Spirit. So then what he did is that he went to find one of the, 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 the church members, church board members. So he began to share that he need, he need God because he confessed that, you know, he lost the Holy Spirit. And he was very troubled in his prayer because he was crying out loud because he realized how precious it is, it is to hold, have the Holy Spirit up until that time. But he also realized uh, what it mean to be at loss when not having the Holy Spirit. So what he did is he really pursue after God in his prayer. So the first day, second day, and third day, he's continually to build up this connection with God through fasting prayer. So by the time he come to the third day, God gave him the Holy Spirit. So why would God give him the Holy Spirit? Maybe because he really poured out his heart before the Lord. God saw the true nature of his heart and God truly saw that he really need him. He really need God. And also perhaps God saw the determination that he don't want to go into a, a direction of losing God and losing the Holy Spirit yet again. So we can see in this particular uh, situation that we may not be able to tell of the change, 
but we need to let God know really what is deep in our heart and have that determination to manifest that change. So that after we receive this change and we see the kindness of God, the goodness of God towards us, that it's not only to receive the change from uh, God's help, but actually determined to preserve ourselves in that change so that we can to abide in God's favor. So from this, yeah, it may seem a, a great, or it may seem a difficulty or a challenge to us is that when we go into fasting in prayer, we may find ourselves at a point of weakness. Yeah, maybe because we're not, we're not having, we're, we're deciding to abstain from food, we're deciding to abstain from water. But the worthwhileness is that if our heart is really that deep into connecting with God, we can see the determined change. And when God sees it, we can see the reward. Therefore, it becomes a win-win when our heart is truly open and transparent before the Lord of, of heaven and earth. That's why it proves worthwhile. So, yes, it can weaken us. We are looking for God's way. We're looking for God's power. We're looking for God's might. But when we uh, expose before God what is actually deep in our heart, we can definitely gain as long as we're willing to show God that determination in heart and we're open fully before God, spreading out what is in our heart, spreading out all into the open so that nothing is hidden but everything is revealed. Then when that happens, God can help us. Then we should determine the turning point. So that's why God does expect as long as we're willing to see that change. Now, when we're thinking about expectations, we also think about, yes, what will be effective, but we also need to recognize also what is ineffective in our fasting prayer. So there come a point in time in Zechariah verse one to five, we find the people and the priests were fasting. Uh, and in their time of fasting, they were wanting to ask whether whether they should fast at this time and at that time. But then God put God really gave them a question to think about, and that, this is now addressing motive with regards to fasting prayer. God asked them, "Did you did you really fast for me? For me?" So this causes us to think and reflect about when we have our purposes of reasons for fasting, it becomes clear to us why we want to fast or why we should. But then the question is, when we're doing this, when we're engaging fasting prayer, are we doing it for God's purpose? Are we really inviting God in this uh, prayer and fasting prayer that we really are looking for his intervention to change in that turning point but also for us to build on a change in such a way that God will, God will accept and when that acceptance does come we can actually go forward whether that turning point will be for days, weeks and months whether we can actually go forward in light of doing things for God and looking at things from God's perspective. Because here, God is addressing us people and seeing whether they did do things or do things from God's perspective. So today, when we get engaged in fasting prayer, we need to look at things from God's perspective. And if we're willing to look at things from God's perspective, uh, for his people, for what God is looking for and seeking, then the prayer can become more effective because we've taken God's perspective into account when we engage into fasting prayer. This is something we cannot take lightly because what we can see here in Zechariah 7 verse 1 to 5 is that he wasn't pleased with it. That's why we need to carefully look at God's perspective. <clears throat> 
so it's more than just an outward um, an outward demonstration that yeah okay we agreed to do fasting prayer we really need to be god-centered and so when we gather in for fasting prayer let us see how we can be more and more uh, god-centered in our uh, approach and application likewise if we want to look at it from god's perspective a real good example is what we see in, in isaiah 58 so in isaiah 58 we find that in verses three and four we find that the the, the, the people of god at the time were fasting for strife and debate and when they were doing this when they had this striving and argument yeah they still pray to god because they pray to god and, and, and fast in that way but let's not forget that when they were doing this god is also observing their manner and motive of their fasting and prayer because during that time there's also there's also finger pointing so this is what god observed in his people and that's why at the time even though they went into fasting and prayer we find god could not accept it so the word of god came to them whereby they could then make a distinction of what they were doing wrong in order to realize what will be acceptable according to god's principle standard so when they real when they could realize this then they could realize what it is that god will approve of and from god's perspective what will help in that particular environment for god's people in, in for god's people to be benefited or helped or comforted in light of what they go through so if we look at verses isaiah 58 verse verses 6 to 9 we can actually see some of the areas that can be overturned and overcome through fasting and prayer so from fasting and prayer it will be to remove wickedness it will be to remove heavy burdens so if we look at the brethren around us we find some of the brethren they may carry heavy burdens they may not share it with us if we know about them then we can actually take it into prayer if we don't know too much about it then and we observe that they are carrying a heavy burden then at least we can bring that before god so that our brethren can grow in lighter burdens to the point that it's removed let alone lightened it becomes removed so then this becomes more effective and then we find that yeah people do have, have sufferings in one way or another but very clearly if the needs are identified and we are united in one heart and one mind to join in fasting prayer about those needs then god will consider because he sees the, the he sees the need but we've considered the need from God's perspective that when we carry it into prayer, then we can gradually see the, the turning point of change. Because God's perspective has been taken into account. And so we find what we see here in verses six to nine is what it is as the fruit that comes from fasting prayer. So when we gather together, this is what this is the turn point that we should be able to experience because we we are willing to pray about these matters, but yet intervene. In, but we're looking for God to intervene in such a way to bring about this uh, these outcomes, which will help God's people. Esther's another example. You know, I'm sure we're familiar with Esther. Esther four verse fourteen to seventeen. And then we find that uh, uh, Mordecai said in uh, verse 14, you know, he said, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And then we find that Esther had to consider what Mordecai was saying. And so from this consideration, especially in an urgent circumstance, we find that Esther did give a reply, and that is to go and gather all the Jews who are present. So when that encouragement was to go and gather, they were to gather together and pray and fast about this particular crisis 
that they will find themselves into. So when Esther did this, she joined them in the fasting prayer as much as the, that all the Jews that were there, the fellow countrymen, when they got this message, being very aware of the crisis to also join in. So when they join in, it's a heart that they are aware, aware of the situation, but one heart, one mind, pleading a build-up day after day for God's intervention. So when we are together in fasting prayer, prayer, we need to know and learn how to plead before God. Yeah, we all know how to pray, but how many of us know how to pray in such a way that we plead for God's help and for God's guidance and for God to intervene at a time that is a great crisis that we're all facing? How many of us know how to plead? because it's also a time of learning in our prayer. Because prayer can take different levels and prayer can be uh, manifested in different ways. But sometimes when we engage in a principle, sometimes that more might be required. And so pleading with the Lord will take more time. Just like um, Isaac, Isaac had to plead, plead, plead for the Lord, plead for the Lord. Here we find that God's people are pleading for help from the Lord. So we find that when Esther encouraged everybody to be in oneness in heart, when they build up this, this, this time of pleading for God's intervention, then eventually this is the time that when God see that, that heart that's been spread out before his presence, then we find that in Esther chapter five and in chapter six, we find that God works quietly to manifest a great work to help deliver his people. Esther took the risk to, to uh, walk towards uh, the king. She received the scepter. The scepter can be is identified as a scepter of righteousness. When she received that, then she was able to um, bring out her petition and plea. Even more so, it then met the approval. When it met the approval, that is the beginning of that, after that third day, the beginning of the turning point for God's people to begin to see a change of progress for God's people to experience deliverance. Then when it changed, then gradually there will be more changes. Why are there more changes? Because God, behind all this, God is beginning to manifest that change. Working into the heart of the king, working into the heart of Esther and others to gradually see a change that only God from heaven could do. So God actually not only worked into the heart of Esther and the fellow countrymen, we find that God also worked into the heart of the king to change and then begin to do more and more of what is, what is righteousness, what is right from God's perspective. And then God's perspective of what is just followed through right up to the end. And then God's people were preserved and delivered. For Mordecai, he didn't doubt that God would manifest what is right and just and deliver his people. But we see the gradual outcome of turning point, pleading, looking for God's uh, right favor, and then walking in that change and then willingness to abide in that change and see the change. Then this becomes a blessed outcome when we're looking for God's purpose and God's favor. It reminds me of um, a testimony of a, of a brother who receives missionaries um, over in one of the African countries, he's a taxi driver. So generally he, 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 he helps the missionaries uh, travel from A to B in, in various places. And then one time he had a, a, a skin condition and basically the, the, the skin is like, uh, the, the skin condition is on his foot and it's like eating into his skin. And the skin is like dissolving itself and it, it's smelling and it's, it's, very, it's very irritable to this particular brother. So what he was trying to do is obviously looking for a, a means to 
solve this particular crisis. So he tried uh, seeking uh, medical help. Obviously, it was very, he was very well known in the area because of his, 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 you know, his job as a taxi driver. And then eventually what he did was, yeah, he tried to contact some, some of the best doctors to try to help cure. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. So then he resorted to fasting prayer. So during that time, he began to, you know, make his request to God and plead to God. By the time we come to the end of the three months, during this time of pleading, during this time of pleading, he is discovering the work of God towards him to answer the prayer, to show his mercy, and then for him to see these changes, whereby God is healing him as much as helping him. So by the time he reached the end of these three months, he could learn about the benefits and the helps of fasting and prayer and what God taught him as much as he, in, you know, pursued fasting and prayer in this way. Yeah, he can see God's compassion and favor to him. What was left with him at the end? Well, yes, God did heal him. Aside a scar on his leg, God did heal him. But why is there a scar? He would learn to re realize that this scar is a reminder of God's grace and mercy towards him. And that's what he can discover from this fasting and prayer. So we find that when we do plead, God does help. And as long as we cause God to see this heart, God works quietly. And the amazing thing is we don't, we don't always, we cannot always see the timing is when God is working quietly. We always see more often than not the effect of, a, of the outcome, but we don't actually see the buildup of when it begins. But the most important thing is that we're seeing is when God is working and that working is becoming more effective, then we can actually discover it is right to look for God's perspective and look for his help. And then we can see the outcome at the end. So here's another uh, great example uh, that we've probably seen before. Ezra 8, verse 21 to 23. Now for Ezra and the people at this time, they're looking for God's perspective. And what we find is that for uh, Ezra and the fellow countrymen at the time, we see that they, let's read it first. Ezra 8, verse 21 to, to 23. Ezra 8, verse 21 to 23. Then I became the fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and our, all, all, all our possessions. For I was ashamed, for, ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road because we had spoken to the king saying, the hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So he fasted and entreated to our God for this and he answered our prayer. Now, when I, when I read this, when I read these verses, to me, initially, it seems like it's very sequential in the order that it occurs in that they, they have this fasting prayer. Then they tell the king what it is that they, they want to do, which is, which is uh, uh, pursue God's principle. And then afterwards, then they gain God's answer. Yet when I look at it, I could be wrong. When I look at it, I look at it in a slightly different way in that they have a principle in mind, which is they know, just as we see in verse 22, about the hand of God is upon those who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against those who forsake him. So they have this principle in mind, they take it to the king, then they travel. Then they do what they see in verse 21 because they want to see God's right way. 
so the people of God at the time, they may they already have a right way of God in terms of a principle in seeking God because they know about the good hand of God, how it's helpful to them. They are ashamed of requ requesting help from the king, okay? So they're not ashamed of requesting help from God. So with this principle in mind, when they're walking out, they are still looking for God's way. And sometimes we may be like this. We have a principle in mind, and with that principle in mind, we, we find it's a good idea. We're not ashamed of walking in God's principle. But there comes a point in time sometimes that when we, even when we've pursued a decision and we've gone forward, as we've walked forward, we may uh, lack or may not actually have that su sufficient strength to actually go forward with greater reasoning that this is the right way to go forward. So sometimes we find that we need to actually return for a greater help in God's direction. And one way of doing that again will come through fasting and prayer. So when the, uh, the people of God came to this point of at the, the river Harbor, what mattered most is that as much as they've gone forward with God's principle, they also recognize that as they go forward, they need to learn to remain submissive and learn to seek the, God, the guidance of God as they continue to go further forward. So the right way of God continues to remain clear because there's, a, there's, a, there's two ways. There's either the opinions of, 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 of people or there's the opinion of God that they seek most importantly. And at this point in time, what mattered most importantly for them is to seek the right way of God. So therefore, to learn to have a clear goal is what we all want to discover in our prayer. It's the same with fasting prayer, but it's the same thing, um, the same matter of principle that we can think about considering to go forward in so that in order to humbly walk with God, that we're always looking for his right way that comes through fasting and prayer. Because just as we see in verse three, uh, 23, God did answer, God did answer. So he fasted and entreated to our God for this and he answered. So at the end of this, we can actually realize that the most important principle really is looking for God's right way. But why was God's right way effective? Yes, all of them were involved. All of them, importantly, all of them at the same time, didn't have an ulterior motive. All the motive was of one heart and mind for looking for God's right way. And whether they were young or old, all of them could also uh, uh, be willing to give their best to this fasting prayer, looking for God's right way. So we can actually see that when more are involved or all are involved, God will not look down upon the child as much as he will not look down upon the youth, as much as he will look, not look down upon those who have been in the faith for many years. All have to learn how to let God know what's in our heart and let God know, Lord, we're looking for this right way. Only you can show us the right way. We all have different opinions, but we're looking, the, looking for the right way according to you, for us, his people. So when we let God know what is in our heart with that type of motive and attitude and mindset, then we can actually bring ourselves closer for God to actually reveal his hand to help us and steer us to the right direction. Just as with uh, the fellow countrymen of God during this time in, in Ezra. So this is what we can all learn together, whether we're younger and older. And then we'll find that the safeguarding by the hand of God really does become something to cherish. And again, as we learned that, yes, Fasting prayer can make us physically weaker, but then just we've seen from the these last few uh, passages, 
it's proved worthwhile. That's why we should not look down upon it, but rather, but rather really continue to entrust uh, matters into the hands of God in our fasting prayer. Now, we can also look at fasting prayer in relation to the day. And what I mean by that is that if we look into the gospel, we find that the people of God, they were at work to, as we know, that they could heal, they could be involved in preaching the gospel, that they can heal, cast out demons, etc., etc. And one of the things is that when God, the Lord sent them out, the Lord hoped that they would remain with him in this teaching, in all these teaching principles. Now, there come a point in time that when they are learning the way of the Lord and learning from the Lord, because the Lord is their teacher, then they find they faced a problem. So when they faced a problem in, uh, in, in Mark chapter 9, verse 27 to 29, they privately asked the Lord, uh, why could they, why they could not, um, you know, uh, cast out this, um, this, uh, you know, this, this evil spirit? Why could they not cast out the evil spirit, the demon? Why could they not cast out? So the Lord answered all of them with a similar like answer, the same answer that it does not come out by, except by prayer and fasting. So what does this actually tell us? It actually tells us that sometimes when we are involved in a work to pray for someone or, or to pray what we would naturally do. Yeah, well, okay, we, we pray. There are some times whereby the standard or the depth of the prayer will require a higher purpose, will require a greater effort in, in, in the work. Because as I said before, prayer is a work. Fasting prayer is a work. So when we are closer with God and we're hoping to remain with God and looking for a, a, a better outcome in light of what we're facing, then we find that, yeah, we face the difficulty and challenge but sometimes it requires a little bit more effort. But what we are still looking for is that we're still looking to overcome and we're still looking for a blessed outcome by intervening and involving God in this particular matter that we're all facing together. So yes, there are some times that we can pray, we can discover the effect from our prayer, but there are some times in our prayer, it's not so effective, so therefore, we need to learn how to apply ourselves to fasting and prayer. Just as the disciples at this time, they have to learn that they have to go one step further and apply themselves to fasting and prayer. So something that we should also learn to do. If prayer, if what, we, if what we're doing in our, in our prayer, we're not actually seeing the effectiveness. So we may need to go one step further. Likewise, here's another uh, aspect of why we need to think about, you know, at our time and in the end time, why we need to learn to fast in prayer. So there come a point in time whereby uh, the disciples of Jesus were challenged about why, um, challenged by the, the Pharisees, why is it that the disciples of Jesus Christ are not, are not uh, fasting and praying? Why are they not doing certain things? So Jesus very clearly said to them in Mark chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. And Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bride bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is uh, with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. 20. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. So what is this actually telling us? In those days at that, that time, there was no need to fast and pray. But when the Lord Jesus was taken up into heaven, that point onwards, we find they would need to learn how to fast and pray because they are physically without the bridegroom to guide them. However, just like for us in the end time, we might be physically without the Lord, but yet we can connect with God in our prayer so that 
when we are fasting and praying, we are looking for God's power and might to overturn circumstances and difficulties in order to see the blessed favor, but also to uh, experience the joy that comes from being with the Lord, even though physically we seemingly may be without his presence physically. Likewise, Apostle Paul, he also, uh, also pursued fasting prayer. And likewise for us, we can also do the same. There are those days, and then when we think about now, there are these days. So these days now are just like the similar to the days of the disciples. In, in disciples in that when the Lord Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, they also have to learn to engage in fasting and prayer. To reason out the need, to reason out the purpose, to reason out why they need uh, God's help, why they need God's intervention, because they realize they also limited in their ability. But also, they are looking for God's unlimited power and strength to be there to cause a better outcome, to cause a blessed outcome. So this we can actually is just basically what I have just uh, mentioned to you earlier, which we can see in uh, Luke chapter five, verse thirty-three to thirty-five. Importantly, what we see in verse thirty-five, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. So now, when we think about it, we are in the end time. The bridegroom is not with us because he's in heaven. But yet we can still we can still connect with him in prayer and in fasting prayer. Do we sense a need of urgency to pursue fasting and prayer? If not, why not? If yes, then why do we see that need in these days? And if we see that, if we recognize the needs, then surely we recognize that while the bridegroom is, is in heaven, and yet we still have this opportunity to interact and connect with him in prayer and fasting prayer, then we find that we have a still a yearning for God's guidance and direction to help ourselves, to help the fellow people of God, to help those who do not yet know God, who can also overcome their burdens, overcome their challenges, overcome their difficulties. So that then they can experience the power of God. And then that will be a true testimony of God working with us, who works in them, who works with us, and abides with us because we continue to remain with the Lord in his teachings. So really it's a teaching that we can see there that in, in those days, which really are future days, that we need to learn how to take up fasting prayer in order to see that blessed outcome. So how to do fasting prayer. So, there are different ways that, that we can do fasting prayer in a practical sense. Sometimes we may have we, we may um, uh, avoid uh, breakfast, then we'll have lunch, dinner, or it could be rotated whereby we have breakfast, we don't have lunch, but we have dinner, or we don't have breakfast, lunch, but we have dinner. There's various things or approaches that we may take in, into heart. But yet, most importantly, what we should be looking for is looking for God's perspective and help and for his intervention during this particular time with purpose and reason why we want to fast and pray. So that's something I've just mentioned to you earlier on about uh, which way we take it in terms of pursuing fasting and prayer practically. And as I said, the most important thing is that despite no matter which approach we take, what we are looking for is to have a heart of sincerity of and truth before God. And so when God sees that, then he can actually draw close to, help us and draw close to answer that prayer request in light of the will of God, from God's perspective. Because we've looked before, not too long ago, about what is effective prayer, fasting prayer, what is ineffective fa fasting prayer. So when we know the difference, then we... We, our senses can be sharpened to actually pursue correctly the right motive that God will accept. 
So that's all I have to share with you concerning fasting prayer. Thank God that we've been able to uh, look into this topic of fasting prayer. I hope from this we can be encouraged to learn about, you know, the value of fasting and prayer, what we need to adjust ourselves to uh, sometimes in order to discover uh, the more meaningful aspects of fasting and prayer in terms of our motive, mindset, and learning about how to have this same uh, united heart and mind that we set our set these matters before God together in his presence in order for God to intervene and help. And as long as that heart remains open, clearly and transparent before the Lord, we should be able to see his help and guidance and that God works and that God will manifest uh, his righteousness and his right way, not just for ourselves, but also for our fellow uh, brethren and also for those who have yet to know God, but to know God. And then we find this is a blessed testimony as we walk with God.